of what's going on this week, and then we'll, we'll talk Tomorrow. about all these pieces here. Um, this week in lab, you're going to be doing the data discussion for experiment 14. So make sure I'm going to go through the data analysis tables that you need to prepare. Make sure you come to lab with those tables already prepared so you can go through that discussion with your group um, of other people doing the same, the reaction under different conditions. Um, in lab, we'll be doing evaluations. We'll be doing the cure surveys. You um, did that survey before the semester or right when the semester started. Now we'll be doing it at the end of this first semester. You'll be checking out of your drawer, cleaning up the lab to so make sure you bring your drawer key. So this chunk of things is going to take a bit of time. It won't be that you're in lab for 20 minutes and a week, okay? So plan on a few hours in lab this week because it is going to take some time, okay? Um, probably not all five hours, but it will, will take some time. Um, then your experiment 14 report is due this week, but see your prof for what the specific details are for your lab section for when it's due. Okay. Um, and I'm going to talk about this here in a little bit more detail, but a reminder, next week, Friday of exam week, our final exam is from 12.30 to 2.30 in here, and then we have to work from 4 too. So I'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, before I start talking about um, experiment 14 and the reminders and then the data tables, um, I wanted to also make an announcement that our chemistry club is ha having a Christmas party on Friday, this Friday, um, in the atrium, so December 5th from 4 to 6, and so all of you are invited to that um, this Friday. Okay. So I've got some data here that we're going to go through and analyze. A um, couple reminders before we go through that. Um, so the tables that I'm going through are on page 14, 9, and 14, 10 in your lab manual. So I'm going through those four tables that it describes in there. Um, there's also then after the tables, there's a series of questions on page 14, 10. You want to incorporate the answers to those questions in your conclusion for experiment 14. But what you don't want to do is write out, you know, question number two answer. Question number three, answer. You want to, in paragraph form, within your conclusion, as you're discussing the data that's in these tables, answer those questions, okay? But don't, don't give bullet point answers. Um, don't forget to calculate percent yield with your GC data. So remember, you weighed your reaction mixture at the end of the reaction and the workup two weeks ago. So you should have that mass before you made your GC sample. Now you need to figure out how much product you have in that sample. So use your GC data and figure out what your total amount of product is in your GC data and then how much of that product or that mass of product is actual product, okay? So you'll, just like you did with experiment eight and 11, if you have, you know, 35% of your mass is, um, isopropyl or propyl toluene, you take 0.35 times the mass um, and figure out what, or 0.35 times that total mass and figure out what mass is the product so then you can figure out your percent yield, okay? So don't forget to do that. Um, another thing is um, we're setting up these tables so that we can look at two things in experiment 14, one of which is that there's a carbocation rearrangement that can take place, okay? Um, which, if a carbocation rearranges, is that a thermodynamic or a kinetic effect? Thermodynamic. If it has time for rearrangement, it's going to be thermodynamic. So you're looking at, does that carbocation rearrange or not? Um, and what conditions under which will it re rearrange, okay? So if you want to think about carbocation rearrangement is one thing that's possibly happening. And then you're also looking at your product distribution. What type of product formed? Was it a kinetic product or was a thermodynamic product that formed um, of the substituted toluenes, okay? So you've got two different things going on um, with the reaction and with all the data that you're pooling. Okay, and in the tables you'll look at that, and in um, 
in the questions that you answer about the tables you're going to be looking at them, okay? All right, so let's start looking at the tables themselves, okay? So um, the first table that you are going to put together is for your own data, and you will only do this for your data, you won't do it for any of the other three people's data that you're looking at, okay? And what you are going to do in that table is you're going to have the headings of the compound, the standard retention time and minutes, the experimental retention time and minutes, and the experimental percent area, okay? <coughs> and don't, these standard retention times that are using, I'm using are specific to this data, so don't use it in place of the standard retention times you should have received from your lab prop. Use what they gave you, okay? Because these are just slightly different than what they gave you. Then the compounds that you're going to look at are toluene, then the metapropyl and ortho isopropyl toluene, metapropyl ortho propyl toluene, the dialkylated toluene, the trialkylated toluene, and then in amongst all this, if you have anything you can't identify, you're going to label it as an unknown. Okay. Um, for the dialkylated toluene and the trialkylated toluene, I'll tell you based on your data, because I looked, I had to get the standard retention times from everybody's data, so I've looked at everybody's data. Um, there was about 13 to 16 minutes or so is where the dialkylated toluenes would come, and about 20 to 22 minutes is where the trialkylated toluenes would come. Okay. Now with this table, because I don't have room to list everything that is on here, for the dialkylated toluenes and uh, trialkylated toluene, you would want to list each of those individually like I did everything here, okay? So don't just give me a summary here. List each of them as individual peaks from this, this data, okay? And list their individual, um, this is kind of the standard retention times. List the individual then retention times. You, your lab prof may or may not want you to give these as standard retention times for the dialkylated and trialkylated because there isn't a standard that I use. It's just that's where the data fell. Okay, they're about dialkylated have a retention time about twice as long as the monoalkylated. Trialkylated have a retention time about three times as long as the monoalkylated. Okay, but what you do want to do is make sure you list each individual experimental <coughs> retention time. And then these are the percent area for each of those peaks, okay? So where we got that information, this is a peak table um, for conditions A um, data. And so all the retention times are coming straight from here, okay? So you would want to list that entire list. And then you would label it to what it corresponds to. Um, and then you also, your percent, your experimental percent area is this number here, this last call, okay? So this is your experimental retention times. This is your experimental percent area, all right? Does everybody see that? Okay. So this first table is just for your data. You're listing information, and you're not doing any further calculation of any information, okay? Just making a big list. And that'll help you then break down your information as you go through the other tables, okay? So then table two, what we want to look at is now we're going to look at the data per reaction conditions, okay? And our A, B, C, and D are the same A, B, C, and D that we defined two weeks ago, okay, for those reaction conditions. So you're going to, for table two, you want to have the headings of the compounds, percent experiment A, percent experiment B, percent experiment C, percent experiment D. And then you're going to list toluene, isopropyl toluenes, propyl toluenes, dialkyl toluenes, trialkyl toluenes. And these are the only compounds we're looking at in um, table number two. All right. So. What we need to do now is when we need to start recalculating things. In order to calculate these percentages, we need to have a total area count for that specific table, okay? And so to come up with that, we need to take all these peak area numbers from our top one being our toluene, take all the peak areas 
for things that are going to be in that table. So toluene, isopropyl toluenes, propyl toluenes, dialkyl toluenes, trialkyl toluenes, okay? So here's our toluene. This is our isopropyl toluenes. This is our propyl toluenes. This down to here is our dialkyl toluenes, and this is our trialkyl toluenes. So all of those things we're looking at in this table, so we've got to add all of these numbers up and come up with a total area count, all right? So that's your total, okay? Then what you're going to do is take each thing that you're looking at in this table and take its area counts divided by that total, all right? So the first one is going to be for the toluene. We're going to take the area counts here for toluene divided by that total that you just came up with, and that is where we're going to get 58.8%, okay? So take the total area count for the toluene, the, or the area count for the toluene divided by the total times 100, 58.8%, yes. So by doing that, we should all get exactly 100% of the Yes, yeah, okay. so, yeah, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Yeah, that's the check. Okay. So then you're going to take, the next thing you're looking at is the isopropyl toluenes. So you're gonna add these three numbers up, divided by that total that you just came up with, and that'll be your, in this case, it was the 10.8%, okay? Then the propyl toluenes, we gotta add these three numbers up, divided by that total, and then you'll come up with the 16%. And then the dialkyl toluenes, we gotta take everything in that 13 to 16 range, so that's gonna be all of these guys to here, we need to add all of those up, divided by that toluene, or that total, to get 10.4%. Um, and then our um, dial collated, we gotta add up all these numbers, except for the bottom one that's unknown, and divide it by the total, okay? So everyone good with that? Yes, okay. So now you're going to do that, not only for whatever conditions you were, so I did it for experiment A, but you're going to do it for all three, all four reaction conditions. So do it for yours, and then do it for the other three that you have data for, okay? And so then, as Morgan pointed out, the, um, the check here is once you've gone through all of this, each of these columns should add up to 100%. All right? So that's how you double check that you've done things correctly. Okay, so that's table number two, all right? Table number three, we're going to look at just the isopropyl toluene. Okay, so we're going to, our total that we're going to divide by is just going to be these three numbers added together. So the area counts for the three isopropyl toluenes. Okay, so you add these three numbers together, that's your total, and then you're going to take, take each one divided by that total. So here's um, our meta, and then our para, and then our ortho, okay? And so... Um, Meta is the greatest, we'll take that, divided by that total, we get 67.6%, then 29.6%, and then 2.8%, okay? And then again, add it up and get 100%, hopefully, all right? Now a note here with experiment A, you usually don't make a whole lot of orthoisopropyl toluene, okay? There's usually not a lot in there. And some of you had so little that the integrator wouldn't even integrate it, even though the peak was in your chromatogram. It was so tiny that there was a small amount in there. So your um, prof, if that's the case, probably wrote something on your data that said that it's less than 0.2% or something like that. It's a really small amount, okay? So you can use that, it being about 0.2% or 0.5% in your, in your table, okay? So don't completely ignore it, account for it, but it's gonna be a really tiny amount, all right? And that's just for the ortho isopropyl toluene. So then once we get our um, isopropyl toluenes, the last table that we are going to look at in table four is then the propyl toluenes. And just like in table two, you're going to fill out the data for your experiment and then the other three conditions, okay? So you're gonna have all four 
sets of conditions for table two, three, and four. And so then the probal toluenes for four are these three. This is what you would add up together to get your total, and then take each one of these divided by that total times 100 to get your percentage. Okay? Yes? Um, for uh, experiments where you use the two bromopropane, if you didn't produce any propyl toluene, you just not put anything. See if that really happens, though. Okay. Look at the data first. Right. Most likely that won't be the case. There'll be at least some in there. Um, but yeah, if you add absolutely nothing, then you wouldn't, you wouldn't worry about it, okay? Um, now, where you um, probably won't see, so B, you probably will, okay? But C and D, you probably won't, right? Okay? So, um, for table number four, you may not have any entries under C and D, if you do C and D if you didn't make any problem time, all right? <coughs> okay, but conditions B, you probably will still see some in there, all right? So now, with these tables, one thing to keep in mind as you're answering these questions is remember that table two, three, and four, you're looking at snapshots of data, okay? You're looking at specific pieces to the data, and you don't want to, when you're answering the questions, only look at one table to answer the question, okay? Make sure that you, you know, like this is the true data for experiment A, okay? It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense that there was a lot of meta isopropyl toluene, right? For conditions A, because it's zero degrees, one, um, one bromopropane. But one thing you want to look back at is, go back to table two, for the isopropyl toluenes for um, experiment A, there was 10.8%, um, okay? Like the majority of what is in that mixture is still toluene. The isopropyl toluenes are 10.8%, but the propyl toluenes are 16%, okay? So you want to go back and look at the tables to keep in perspective what you're talking about, okay? Especially when things start getting a little bit confusing, all right? So, Put the tables together individually, but don't isolate um, individual tables in two, three, and four. Make sure you're looking at the whole picture as you're looking at this information, okay? All right, so that is what I have for data analysis. Now we'll move on. I'm gonna move things over to the middle and we'll start going through the lab exam and we'll go through it as quickly as we can, okay? So if you look at the Excel spreadsheet from the registrar's office for where your exam is, some of the lab sections say 102, some of the lab sections say 104. We're going to end up using both rooms for the exam, okay? So um, what you want to do is wait outside in the hall, um, and then when we're ready for people to start coming in, we'll fill this whole room first. So we'll fill 102 first because it's the, full, it's the biggest room. And then once 102 is full, then we'll fill 104, okay? We'll have room for everybody, but we're going to fill this room first and then fill 104. So don't necessarily go by what the registrar schedule says for your lab section. Go by the fact that we're going to be in either one of these rooms. We'll fill this room first, and then after that, we'll move people to the other room, okay? Um, but do be on time. We will start the exam right at 1230, um, and you'll have two hours to complete the exam. Okay. Um, if you have paperwork from the Academic Success Center that needs to be signed for this exam, I am the person that signs it. So make sure you see me to have me sign that information, okay, and that paperwork. Okay, things to bring to the exam. You want a calculator with memory erase. So you can't use your cell phone as a calculator. Bring a real calculator 
to the exam. You will need a calculator, so make sure you have it with you, okay? Um, but don't bring a cell phone. Um, bring a ruler. Remember TLC, you were making measurements, so it's probably a good idea to have a ruler with you, um, especially that you measure in metrics, okay? Um, bring pencils and erasers. So we don't want you doing this exam in pen. Please do it in pencil. That way if you have to change things or you decide to change things or you decide to recalculate things, it's easy for us to figure out what your answer is that you intend. Okay? So no pins on the exam. Please use a pencil. Okay? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through all 33 questions of that practice exam. Kind of lightning speed here. Marking your lab section correctly. Don't forget that point. Okay? You'd be surprised how many people forget that one easy point. Also, make sure when you hand it in, we're going to hand them in per lab section. Get it in the right lab section, too. Okay? That's kind of the other test. Can you read the sign? Can you mark the exam? All right. So here we go. We're going to go through. So I've already started showing you answers here. Um, Go through the exam. Okay, so question number one. We've got this compound here. Um, the compound co below could be extracted into water um, from an organic solvent using and then removed from the aqueous layer into an organic solvent by the addition of. So is it A, water and sodium bicarbonate? B, sodium bicarbonate and water? C, sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid? D, hydrochloric acid, sodium hydroxide, or E, sodium bicarbonate, sodium hydroxide? It's going to be C, right? We need sodium hydroxide to deprotonate it, and then to put it, um, to get it back into an organic solvent, we would need hydrochloric acid to protonate it again, okay? So you need to deprotonate it first to make it aqueous soluble, then we reprotonate it to make it soluble in something organic. So that answer is C. So, um, Number two, the table below lists solubility data for benzoic acid. Benzoic acid, which solvent would be the best solvent for recrystallizing an impure sample of benzoic acid? So when you're looking at solubility and recrystallization, you want, what do you want at low temperature? Really low solubility, right? And what do you want at high temperature? High solubility. So the only solvent that has that would be solvent B, right? So the answer is B. Okay, which of the following solvents will end up as the top layer in the organic, or the aqueous organic separation with water? We're using a density of one for water, okay? So we want it in the top layer. So is it more dense or less dense than water? Less dense, and so our two answers that are less dense, less dense are two and three, so the answer would be B. Okay. The confirmation of butane viewing down the C2, C3 bond with the dihedral angle of zero between the two CH3 groups is called it's going to be B, eclipsed, right? Not gauche, not anti, not staggered. Okay. Which of the following confirmations would you expect to have the lowest strain energy? So what it, when you're looking at confirmations of cyclohexane, what's going to have the lowest strain energy? Things that are equatorial, right? You want all your substituents equatorial if possible. So the only answer that has that would be D. Everything else has at least one axial substituent, okay? Which of the following would not cause a decrease in the extraction yield in the extraction of trimeristin from nutmeg? 
So we're not decreasing our extraction yield. Large nutmeg particle size, inefficient mixing, solvent evaporation during filtration, evaporation of trimeristin during the simple distillation, short contact time between solvent and nutmeg. It's going to be D, right? You're not going to evaporate your trimeristin during the simple distillation because you used a hot water bath. Okay? So it's not possible. Okay. Now we've got a yield question here. If 2.5 grams of trimeristin are used in the hydrolysis reaction shown below and 0.68 grams of meristic acid is isolated, what is the percent yield of meristic acid? So first of all, we need to figure out a theoretical yield before we can calculate a percent yield, right? So to do that, we'll take our 2.5 grams of trimeristin Divide it, base, so this is multiplied by the inverse, or divide by the molecular weight of trimeristin. Then remember, there's a mole ratio of meristic acid to trimeristin of three moles meristic acid to one mole trimeristin. So don't forget this part, okay? Because for every one trimeristin, you get three meristic acids out. Then we multiply by the um, molecular weight of meristic acid, we get a theoretical yield of 2.34. So if we divide our 0.68 by uh, 2.34, we get 29%. So the answer is B. Okay, so make sure you're really proficient with yield calculations. identify the presence or absence of an alkene functional group in a compound, one should add bromine and tetrachloride to see if the yellow-red ro bromine color disappears, add a drop of potassium permanganate to the acetone solution to see if the purple color disappears and brown precipitate forms, do a density test to see if the substance is heavier or lighter than water, collect an IR spectrum to look for sp2ch stretches 3150 to 3000 inverse centimeters, and C double and C stretches um, at about 1640 inverse centimeters. Do a biostain flame test to see if a green color is present. Um, do options A, B, and D, or do um, only test A and E. So what would be the answer that pertains to alkenes? It's going to be F. So we're going to do A, B, and D um, to look for an alkene because these are our two characterization tests and then in the IR spectrum this is very characteristic of an alkene. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, number nine, a distilled fraction of an organic compound gave the following test results. When a few drops of bromine, ca um, bromine carbon tetrachloride solution were added, the orange color gradually faded and a wet pH paper up placed above the tube gives a red color. So what does that tell you? It's acidic, right? It's giving off HBr. After adding one drop of potassium permanganate and acetone to the distilled substance and waiting three minutes, the purple color remained and no brown precipitate was seen. So what does that tell you? It's not an alkene or an alkyne, right? But something happened here. So the um, one functional group that you will get that HBr generation from is an alkane. So the answer is A. If two components of an ideal solution have close boiling points, differ only by 15 degrees, such as hexane and cyclohexane, one can still use a fractional distillation to sep separate them by doing the following. Um, distill the pot slowly and control the temperature rise carefully. Add a second steel wool packed Liebig column on top of the distilling flask in order to gain more theoretical plates. Add more boiling chips, pack more steel wool in the Liebig column so it's packed tightly. Use a larger magnet to improve stirring, mixing of the solution in the distillation flask. So which one would that be? Letter B, we want to add more theoretical plates. When you add more theoretical plates, you'll get a better separation, and a separation of things that are much closer in boiling point. A student received the GP analysis of her set Sample, it had MW equal to 10 or 10,593 and a PDI of 2.19. The MN was C. 
So how are MWN, MN, and PDI related? MW divided by MN equals PDI, right? So we had MW and we had PDI, so we solved for MN. And so the answer is 4,837. Organic lab student Erlenmeyer used 5 mils of toluene instead of ethyl benzene in the experiment A bromination reaction. He used a hot water bath to remove the reaction solvent. Predict what Earl will observe in the test of the product. Earl will observe negative silver nitrate test, no white to yellow precipitate form. Earl will observe a positive silver nitrate test. Earl will observe a crude residual product of density greater than 1. Earl will observe a crude residual product of density less than one, A and D or B and C? So what is the answer? So are toluene and ethyl benzene related? Yeah. Pretty closely, right? Can you brominate um, the toluene just like you did the ethyl benzene? Yes, so the answer is F. So you would get a sil positive silver nitrate test and you would see um, res crude residual product that had a density greater than one. Okay, so this guy, um, I filled in the rest of this table, okay? So we're looking at the physical data table of reagents for the bromination reaction. What we're trying to figure out is what is our limiting reagent, okay? So we were given all the ta data except for what's listed in moles, so I went through and used Density, molecular weight to figure out ethyl benzene has <coughs> 0.041 moles. Hexane had 0.38 moles. Took the um, mass of N-bromosuccinamide used divided by its molecular weight, it was 0.042 moles. And the benzoyl peroxide, um, 0.25 grams divided by 242 grams per mole was 0.0010 moles. So what is the limiting reagent for this reaction? It's going to be A, right? Ethyl benzene. Because your benzoyl peroxide was just a radical initiator. So it's not something that's going to be a limiting reagent. Okay, you're just used initially to get your radicals to stop, start forming, but it's not something that will be considered a limiting reagent. All right? So of these three, ethyl benzene is the limiting reagent. Which of the following is not a suggested means for initiating the formation of the Grignard reagent in experiment eight? Adding a crystal of iodine to etch the magnesium surface, crushing the magnesium metal <coughs> with a glass rod, vigorously stirring the reaction mixture upon the addition of bromoalkane, warming the reaction flask with your hands. C. C. We didn't want to stir the mixture when we were forming the um, Grignard reagent, okay? All of the others would work for being something you would do to initiate the Grignard reagent formation. Which of the following is not a side reaction of the Grignard reaction? In this case, using ethyl magnesium bromide to form secondary alcohol, um, to form a secondary alcohol is conducted improperly. So um, we've got our Grignard reagent and then our, um, our bromo, um, well, here's our bromoalkane, so it's bromoethane, would get, those two reacting would be, result in butane. Our Grignard reagent reacting with water would give us ethane. Um, desired alcohol reacts with air to yield a ketone. The desired secondary alcohol reacts with excess acid during workup to form a mixture of alkenes, or all of the above. going to be all of them, right? All of those things would be um, side reactions that could have occurred um, in the Grinder reaction. Okay, yeah. okay. so here's, um, we've got a lab and lecture tied together here. 
A non-nucleophilic base, quinoline, abbreviated as NU, was with our dots over it, was used for the dihydrobromination of one bromoethylbenzene. Which of the following is the most plausible geometry for elimination? So first of all, what type of elimination is it? It's an E what? E2. E2, right? Okay. So what do you need for that type of elimination? What kind of geometry? Antiperiplanar. So that's what it's asking you here. So which answer would that be? B. Okay. So one year, the Chem 225, 255 students were made, assigned to make three octanol. That's all they made with their Grunier reaction. They had two different routes. Group A was using bromoethane and hexanol. Group B um, was assigned bromo, one bromopentane and propanol. So group B had great results. They got their three oct octanol, no problem. Group A had some problems. So they, um, when they measured boiling points, they were much decreased from the 175. They were 105 to 125. Their IR spectra gave a strong um, peak at 3,300 inverse centimeters and no peak at 1,700 inverse centimeters. So what does that tell you? <coughs> form the alcohol and the aldehyde was gone, right? So they did form an alcohol. Um, but the fingerprint regions didn't match, three octanol in the IR. Um, the product gave a negative DMP test and a positive CAN test, so it went from an aldehyde to um, an alcohol, so negative DMP and positive CAN, that's what that shows. And the product did not re did react with sulfuric acid to give a mixture of alkenes, but not the expected octenes in the next experiment. So here's our possible observations. The hexanal solution actually contained propanol. The bromoethane bottle actually contained bromopentane. Either the bromoethane or hexanol solution was wet with water, quenching the Grignard reagent before it could be it could do the desired reaction. Either the bromoethane or the hexanol contained a lot of oxygen or other oxidant, and the desired three octanol was oxidized to the three octanol before it could be analyzed. So we know D didn't happen, right? Because we didn't have peaks at 1300. Um, we know that the Grignard reagent wasn't quenched because you did form, there was an alcohol form, so the Grignard reagent was formed. The bromoethane bottle um, actually containing bromopentane um, wouldn't give us things with a, a lower boiling point. It's going to give us bigger chains so or a higher boiling point. So the answer is the hexanol solution actually contained propanol, which would have decreased the boiling point, made smaller chain alcohols, but still done the Grignard reaction. Okay. Here we're looking at some IR data, and we want to find the correct assignment. So we need to go through and find what is incorrect. So in the first group of data, what is incorrect? The SP2, right? Because this should be SP3 and this should be SP2. Um, for B, what is incorrect? Is B correct? Yep, B is correct. So C, what was incorrect about C? We're calling it bending instead of stretching, right? And for D, we've got our SP2s flipped here again. And then at 16.01, it's C double bond C stretching, not C double bond O stretching. And then for E, we've got the wrong, again, <coughs> carbonyl stretching, which it should be C double bond C stretching. Okay, so P is the correct answer. So you gotta, that one you gotta read carefully find the correct and incorrect. No. All right. What is the purpose of sodium bicarbonate used in the workup of the Grignard reaction in experiment eight? So what did it do? You were neutralizing any remaining sulfuric acid, right? So it was B. 
Which of the following alkenes is least likely to be produced in experiment 11 if the student is assigned bromoethane and valeraldehyde as a starting material? So first of all, what alcohol would you make? Bromoethane and valeraldehyde? Three heptanol, right? So which heptines would you expect? Two and three, right? So the least likely to form would be the one heptene. So that's answer A. In experiment 11, which of the following statements regarding the product ratios and why they form is true? Um, there's more cis than trans because of antiparaplanar geometry. There are more trans than cis because of antiparaplanar geometry. There's more cis than trans because cis alkenes are more stable. There are more trans than cis because trans alkenes are more stable. It's going to be D. There's more trans than cis because trans are more stable. Which of the following would not decrease the retention time of a sample in GC? Increasing the column temperature, increasing the column length, increasing the carrier, glass, carrier gas flow, switching to a lower boiling compound, all of the above would decrease the retention time. So it'd be B, right? If you make the column longer, you're not going to decrease retention times. You're going to make them longer because it takes longer for it to come out the column. On the GC instrument used in organic lab for experiment 8 and 11, how are compounds detected as they elute from the column? The ions produced when they are produced when they are burned in a flame produce a current that can be measured. The mass is detected on an analytical balance. The mass spectrum is measured with a mass spectrometer. The IR spectrum is measured with infrared light. A. a. The ions produced when they are burned in a flame produce a current that can be measured. And that's the flame ionization detector. Okay, so a student, um, students unknown, was not soluble in water, one molar HCl, or two molar NaOH. It was soluble in ether and concentrated um, H2SO4. So then we're going back to um, remembering our solubility tables from experiment six. It did not decolorize with um, bromine. It did not give a yellow solid when um, exposed to 2,4 DNP. It turned red when exposed to steric ammonium nitrate. So what does all that tell you? No ketones. No chemical tests. What would give a positive can test? Alcohol. Alcohol. And then um, you've got, um, it gave a yellow flame for the Bielstein flame test. So what does that tell you? It's not a, it doesn't have a halogen. What is the most likely structure for, for this compound? And you've got the IR spectrum here too. So which, which of those possibilities is the most likely compound? So it's between C and D. That's where you've got to go back to that solubility data because the small chain alcohols will be soluble in water, HCl, NaOH. Longer chain are not going to be. So the answer is D. A student collected an IR spectrum of his or her unknown. It is shown below based on the IR spectrum, which of the following chemical tests would be positive for the compound. So what do you see in this IR spectrum that would correspond to these, these tests? C. C, the bromine addition test, because you've got here something in the 3000 region that's probably an SP2CH stretch. And then you also probably have this around the 1600 region, you have something that looks like the C double bond C stretch. Okay. Which of the following mechanism, mechanisms represent the, um, the cracking of cyclopentadiene dimer into cyclopentadiene? So is it A? No, because you're not going to get the right um, distribution. Is it B? So you'll get 
from this arrow and this arrow, you'll get one cyclopentadiene. And then if you look at these arrows, you'll get the other one. So the answer is B. C won't give you the right product, and D won't give you the right product. The deal's not a reaction performed in lab to make an phenol by cyclo two two one hept five en two three dicarboxamide was very fast due to the fact that the diene was locked in the S cis conformation. The dienophile was electron rich. The dienophile was locked in the S cis conformation. The diene was electron rich. The dienophile was electron poor or combos of that. So is A true? Yes. yes. Okay. Are there any others that are true? E, right? The dienophile was electron poor. You've got the two carbonyl groups on there, so the answer is G. And that's the good combination for a good deals alder is <clears throat> diene is an S cis conformation, dienophile is electron poor. Okay. Considering the fo following TLC of a reaction mixture at time equals zero and at end of the reaction for the reaction in which A plus B was to produce C, A, B, and C are visualized on the TLC plate under UV light. Which of the following statements is not true? So the starting materials were consumed in the reaction. So we've got reaction and then the end where the starting materials consumed because <coughs> we don't have any more spots for starting materials so yes the final product is impure true you've got two spots there okay the product is more polar than the starting materials that would be false right because you've got higher RF values for product and lower RF values for your starting materials the starting materials are pure It's hard to see, right? We've got A plus B, so it looks like we only have two spots, right? So your answer is going to be C. The one statement that was not true is the product is more polar than the starting material. Okay. As soon as developing TLC conditions for a reaction in which the starting material was converted into one product, A goes to B. In pure hexane, the <coughs> RF values of both A and B were zero. In one to one hex, so the RF values were down here, our spots were down here. In one to one hexane alkylostate, you were way up here. It's difficult to see what happened in the reaction because you've got your spots with the same RF values. So what would you change your solvent to? Pure ethylastate? That would make things more polar, right? So it'd make them travel even higher, faster up the plate. Three to one hexane ethyl acetate. That'd be a good choice because it's between hexane um, and one to one hexane ethyl acetate. So that'd be a good choice. One to three hexane ethyl acetate. That's more polar, pure ethanol. Tons more polar. So the answer is B. Which of the following compounds would give a positive 2,4 dinitrophenyl hydrazine test? What gives a positive test? Ketones are out, aldehydes, so two octanone is our answer. B, which is the following statement about the diels alder reaction between cyclopentadiene and N-phenomalamine is not true. The endo product is formed. That's true, right? The reaction is slow without the use of a callus. That's not true. We don't have a callus. The reaction is concerted. That's true. The reaction is a 4 plus 2 cycloaddition. That's true. So the answer is B. In experiment 14, toluene was used for the fetal crafts alkylation with one bromopropane and two bromopropane. In this reaction, toluene served as a solvent, an aromatic reactant, a solvent and an aromatic reactant, or a catalyst. C, it's both the solvent and the aromatic reactant. And here, right on time, we'll finish with the last one. Okay. An organic, organic lab student, Earl Meyer, used his 3 octanol from experiment 8 for experiment 11 elimination reaction to form a mixture of octenes. Earl noted during the steam distillation of acidic water with 
Alkene product that the boiling point range was 85 to 100 degrees, well below the literature boiling points of 2 and 3 octane, 122 to 123. Reason for Earl's observation is the alkene mixture is impure. The thermometer that was used was cal not properly calibrated. The boiling point range is the result of the partial vapor pressure of acidic water and partial vapor pressure of the alkene mixture during the steam distillation. The bar barometric pressure was lower than 760 millimeters per mercury millimeters of mercury during the distillation. It's going to be C, right? It's not that it's impure. It's not that there's a problem with the thermometer and it's not the barometric pressure. It's that you're just co-distilling two things over. Okay. All right. So that besides my students I will see in lab this week. The next time I'll see you is a week from or week and a half now. So a week from this coming Friday. So remember December 12th, 1230 to 230. Make sure you are here right at 1230 or before for the exam.